This video is sponsored by Siran J Zhao. Link to the channel down below. Ah uh, yes, Future Cops, the unlicensed Street Fighter movie made in Hong Kong, featuring Son Goku from Dragon Ball and sexy Mario Brothers. Look, it's complicated. It's not a very good movie. The pacing is all over the place, character motivations are paper thin, and the humor is hit or miss. Yet, despite being a cheap cash in from 90s Hong Kong cinema, this movie is generally well liked by the cult movie community. Behind this film is writer, director, producer Wong Jing, the schlockmeister of Hong Kong cinema, certainly a controversial figure. But just like this movie, Wong Jing's filmmaking is generally well liked and well received, despite his propensity for quantity over quality. Love him or hate him, Wang Jing was, at one time, the backbone of Hong Kong cinema, keeping everyone employed and keeping the film industry alive through sheer productivity and marketability. And to do that, Wang Jing has to make his movie quickly and cheaply. That means Future Cops is the perfect case study for indie filmmakers who have no money and time. So today, let's dive into this schlocky mess and see how the master himself wrote this movie quickly how he managed to keep the cost low, and maybe even appreciate the filmmaking techniques behind this unassuming director. Wang Jing, he might just be more of an artist than you think. In the distant future of 2043, Hong Kong crime lord, the general, has been apprehended and will face trial in a week. To save the boss, Kent, Tai King and Toyota travel back to the year 1993 to assassinate the young judge before he can take office. And our hero, the future cops, T-Man, Broomhead, and Sing follow suit. Those are the real character names by the way. Yes, they are all knockoff Street Fighter characters. But the story also sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? That's right, Terminator 2, released two years prior to this movie and was a massive hit in Hong Kong. This is the primary way Wang Jing manages to write so quickly, by borrowing ideas. Bad guys holding students hostage in a school? Fight Back to School 2, released a year prior. A coward student being bullied? A reference to Doraemon, with matching character names. Even the opening action scene starts with a Star Wars shot. There is a reference to Super Mario World, Hong Kong horse racing, and football, which is also popular in Hong Kong. Wang Jing is this pop culture sponge, absorbing everything he sees and applying them to his works. By using these pre-existing elements, the amount of creative work needed is drastically cut down. The premise and the characters are pre-baked. All he needed to do is link them together and tell a cohesive story. And that is where Wang Jing's genius comes in. I talked about the worst Chinese movie on this channel before, Pure Hearts into Chinese show bits. In that movie, virtually everything is a trope. Sugar mama, suicide, gang violence, sexual bribery. But in that movie, every trope element remains just that, a trope. In Future Cops, these tropes are full-fledged stories. The Future Cops from a dystopia finds love in present day. The main character being Bowley leads to him fighting back with the help of the Future Cops. In turn, leads to him being prideful and cocky causing him to break up with his love. They are cliché stories, but are stories nonetheless. This means Wang Jing doesn't just absorb the media, he studies them, digests them. He knows very well what makes these tropes work. Indeed, Wang Jing is known to be a massive cinephile. The only reason all these tropes are pop culture stuff is because they serve as a selling point. Street Fighter meets Dragon Ball meets Mario. Who would want to watch that? But when he lets loose, that's when we get a chance to peek into his mind and realize how vast his cinematic knowledge is. In this music montage, we see him paying homage to Jean-Jacques Arnaud's The Lover, Zhang Yimou's A Terracotta Warrior, Ghost, as well as a movie so obscure I can't find any information on. That is some deep cuts. That's the amount of knowledge you need just to make a schlocky film. So, if you are a filmmaker, study movies, a lot of movies, popular, art house, domestic, and foreign, and also study pop culture. When you are in tune with the world, that's when you can write with ease and with efficiency. Now we know how he writes fast, but how does he shoot fast and more importantly, 
cheap. In truth, unless he's intentionally going for that grimy, carefree look, his movies almost never look cheap. In pre-production, Wang Zheng cleverly decides to shoot the film mostly in a high school. Why? Because high schools are empty in the summer, so it's cheap to rent. It's a big location with very scenery. It has offices for the crew, cafeteria for the craft, individual classrooms for actors and makeups. But on the production front, Wang Zheng also has a few tricks. One way to reduce cost and time is his use of two shots and group shots. Now, in a regular movie, the most basic way to shoot a dialogue scene is shot reverse shot. You see one guy talking, and then you cut to the other guy responding. That means you have to shoot the dialogue scene at least twice. And no, because of lighting setups and crew member off screen, you don't often get to shoot with two cameras at once. In future cops, shot reverse shots are almost non existent. Almost every single dialogue scene is framed like this, with two or more characters in the frame. Because you only need to shoot the dialogue scene once, you cut down the shooting time by half. In any ordinary director's hand, this sort of composition would be very flat and boring. But Wang Jing, through clever staging, always gives it a sense of dynamism. There is always movement in the frame, and there is always foreground, midground, background. It's an old school technique used by the likes of Orson Welles and Steven Spielberg. Yes, I just compare Wang Jing to Orson Welles and Spielberg. Sue me. Actually, don't. Now, take a look at his action. A traditional kung fu film needs a lot of good choreography, which requires a lot of time to practice and get ready. That costs money. More than 120 tick. Do you have the patience or not? Nope. Wang Jing's style action is much more comedy driven. There actually isn't a lot going on. See, they aren't exchanging blows. But see how the camera, the actors, and the background are all in motion. Fast motion. It feels way more energetic than just a bunch of people floating around. Additionally, Wang Jing understands that the most important part of the hit isn't the hit itself. It's the aftermath, the reaction, the crash. In his cheaply produced fight scenes, all the budget and time went to shots of people being tossed around. And since the end of a fight feels impactful, it retroactively makes the entire fight more intense. These stunts do take time to prepare, but they can be shot with body doubles, without the actors present, so it saves money. It seems Wang Jing has an endless amount of techniques to maximize impact and minimize cost, but to talk about them all would cost us another hour. But through just these few techniques, we can see a pattern. When faced time and financial limitation, Wang Jing's solution isn't to cheap out, but to find an alternate solution. There may be less resources allocated to his movie, but there is just as much effort into making it presentable. Now we come to the chapter in which we have to confront the reality that Schlockmeister Wang Jing has always been a solid filmmaker. The opening scene of the film is actually really fun, despite in reality, it is really small in scale. Just one car and a bunch of static extras on wires. But it feels big. A lot of the shots are at a low angle, looking up at the scene, making everything seem bigger. The editing is fast but cohesive. Action, reaction. Shoot, explosion. There's always something new going on, from laser to gunfight to car crash, to foot chase, to fist fight, all within the span of a few minutes. Now, look at how he edits explosions. His repeated cut extends the spectacle, but it's edited quickly, so it still feels like a single explosion instead of an instant replay. Even minor explosions aren't glossed over. Every small explosion sends small fragments flying, shelf items, glass, papers. It accentuates the force of the explosion. Even the smallest details are not without thought. Wang Jing knows how to dress a scene on a budget, using balloons to add a dash of color in an otherwise white and flat frame. Adding color liquid to give the lab a little bit more life. Even the hanging clothes on a pastel wall feels deliberate. Their colors go together really well. This is why Wang Jing was respected and at times loved by film goers. He makes crappy movies on the cheap and on a schedule but within his work, there is care. From the biggest set pieces down to a single dialogue shot, Wang Jing is cheap, but he is not lazy. 
So, do I like this movie? Heck no, but I think you should still watch it. The movie opens with a self-deprecating joke, a poster featuring Fight Back to School Part 90 from producer Wang Jingjing. Clearly, Wang Jing is self-aware through all this. He knew what he was making, and he nevertheless put his best into it. And that alone is worthy of study. We have seen other filmmakers with limitations. Not one at IGG produces war epics in a ghetto in Uganda. And despite all the limitations, his films are loved and praised. Kevin Smith made Clerks inside a convenience store, and blockbuster master Christopher Nolan's debut film has a budget of 6,000 bucks. That's why you should watch Future Cops and a lot of other Wang Jing movies. We all have limitations. How you deal with it will determine the quality of your work. Beside, it is still the best Street Fighter movie to date.